dear Vice President Chen, ladies and gentlemen, and our, our, our TIGB students, welcome to this uh, um, TIGB special lecture. Uh, this is our uh, most important uh, event uh, in TIGB lectureship. And it is our great pleasure today uh, to have invited uh, our Vice President, Dr. Chen, um, to give this uh, lecture. And as you know, uh, Dr. Chen they used to be the Vice President of Academia Sinica. Until two years ago, that he was elected as the Vice President of our nation. So it is our very honor to have uh, Dr. Chen come back to Academia Sinica. Dr. Chen uh, received his uh, B.S. degree from National Taiwan University um, with a zoology degree, and then the, a master's degree from uh, public health. After that, uh, he went to the United States to get his PhD from uh, Johns Hopkins uh, um, University in uh, epidemiology. His research has been in uh, epidemiology and human genetics. Uh, he has made many uh, important contributions to the public health. For example, he was the world's expert in uh, blackfoot disease and uh, chronic uh, arsenic uh, uh, poisoning. And then the, he was uh, the main contributor in Taiwan that uh, provided key evidence showing that uh, liver cancer is correlated with the uh, HPV virus uh, titer. Because of that, the government decided to uh, vaccinate uh, all the newborn um, uh, children for uh, hepatitis, hepatitis B uh, uh, vaccine which greatly reduced the uh, titer of uh, HPV and also the occurrence of uh, liver cancer. So this is uh, a famous success story um, contributed by Dr. Chen's uh, research. And Dr. Chen is not only a great scientist, but he has also served many posts in the government. He has served as the, uh, the uh, chairman of uh, National Science Council, now is Minister of uh, Science and Technology. He's also served as a Minister of Health. And that was the time when the nation was confronted uh, with uh, SARS. So many of you, if you are here at that time, more than 10 years ago, he was uh, one of the heroes fighting the SARS and control the disease. So you can see that uh, he's an outstanding scientist and an outstanding uh, uh, administrator and now a national leader. And his contribution has been uh, recognized by many prestigious awards, including just about all the important awards in Taiwan and internationally. For example, he was uh, elected as the uh, foreign associate of National Science, uh, National Academy of Sciences in, in the United States um, just uh, <coughs> last year. So it is our great pleasure to welcome uh, Dr. Chen, Vice President Chen, to deliver this lecture. Let's give uh, the warmest welcome for Dr. Chen. <laughs> as a vice president of Academia Sinica today. <laughs> <laughs> That's the best time I have uh, to enjoy my academic research. But uh, anyway, today I'm going to talk about this on uh, the global public health. And it needs the science and humanity. As we all know that health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of the disease and infirmity. So we, everybody agrees, and it's also inconsistent with WHO's uh, declaration that the enjoyment of the highest attainable standard of health is one of the fundamental rights of every human being without distinction of race, religion, political belief, economy, or social condition. And the health of all people is fundamental to the attainment of peace and security and is dependent on the fullest cooperation of individual and states. So it is very important 
for each state, the government have a responsibility for the health of their people and to be fulfilled only by the provision of adequate and social measures. If there is an unequal development in different countries in the promotion of health and control of diseases, especially the communicable disease, is a common danger. And I'm going to share with you the story about the SARS outbreak control. Oops. And in this um, apocalypse, there's a so-called four horsemen. Uh, that's in the Bible. And these uh, four horsemen always come together. That's the plague, the infectious diseases, or the disease outbreak, and the war, and the famine, and also the deaths. And in this on the UN's uh, Sustainable Development Goal, this on the goal three is the good health and well-being. However, if you look at these 17 goals, they are all related to health. For example, no poverty, zero hunger, equal equality of education, gender equality, clean water, and so forth, climate action, life on below water, life on land, and even the partnership of for the goal, they are all involved in this uh, human health. And what is public health? Public health is the art and science of preventing disease, prolonging life, and promoting health through the organized efforts of society. So public health basically focuses on the entire spectrum of health and well-being, not only the eradication of particular diseases. And when uh, Taiwan becoming an Asian uh, society. I think the health promotion and disease prevention have become more and more important than disease treatment and diagnosis. And public health aim at the primary, secondary, and tertiary prevention of disease progression. And many ac activities are targeted at the populations, such as the health campaign, but public health services also include the provision of personal services uh, to individual persons such as vaccination, behavioral counseling, and health care. And what is the health spectrum? Anyone who have a contact with this environmental agent, for instance, the infectious agent, he may become, remain healthy, or become have a subclinical syndrome or sign, or become a mild disease, moderate, severe, and disease. We call this the spectrum. And there's a the so-called disease pyramid. Most of the people who are infected by influenza virus recently, they have a mild disease, rather died from the diseases. So it's a kind of a disease pyramid. So we, in public health, we have primary prevention to prevent uh, infected people to become uh, progressed to uh, subclinical disease or from the mild disease. And if it's going to progress to the mild disease or moderate, then we can have an early diagnosis of the disease and give it a prompt a treatment to avoid any kind of complication or severe disease. If a person unfortunately become Ill, severely ill, then we have to give uh, the patient uh, a lot of uh, terminal stage on uh, rescue. And then there's a, we call this the tertiary prevention to prevent uh, death. So in public health, we have so-called, the uh, primary, secondary, and tertiary prevention. And when I was invited by um, did, um, President Liao to give a talk, and I would like to say global health, and so I checked this on uh, WHO's uh, recent document, and what are the 10th threats to global health in year 2018? And if you look at the list, and you will see, wow, this is quite not familiar, familiar to all of the people here because we don't have this kind of a threat, except two. I, I will share with you. The first one is pandemic influenza. That's an, uh, currently, there's uh, more than 150 public health institutions in 110 countries working together to go through this uh, global surveillance and response to the pandemic influenza. I will share with you our story in Taiwan later. And the second one is health in country. Conflict countries always ravage this um, health system across the world. And war party, warring parties are increasing attack health facilities and health care workers. It's really uh, unfortunate. And cholera also uh, here nearly uh, 
100,000 people uh, annually in community weighed down by poverty and conflict. If Syria and also malaria, we can see that still remain a very important uh, global health threat uh, in year 2018. And next one, show you this uh, natural disaster is also a threat to uh, global health. And meningitis, yellow fever, malnutrition, and food poisoning. Among these 10 threats, basically five of them can be prevented by immunization, by vaccination. Unfortunately, in 2018, people still come across a, a large outbreak of this vaccine preventable disease. So we definitely have to help these countries to contain the outbreak and then to help the people there. And the natural disaster is the one we still have the problem and pandemic influenza we still have to, have to come back with these two as race. But in others, I think we fortunately in Taiwan we enjoy uh, a, a good health due to this uh, machine preventable disease. And if we look at this uh, uh, test rates, then I would like to share with you there's a leading causes of this in Taiwan dating back to 1906. None of you are born there. Then 1952 and 2014. Basically, uh, even in 1950s, in Taiwan, infectious disease remained a very important threat to our national health. Look at that. Malaria, tuberculosis, gastroenteritis, including this uh, cholera I just mentioned, and also pneumonia, basically from this uh, influenza and other kind of infection. But in Taiwan, fortunately, we have uh, used some strategies to control the infectious disease, including the environmental sanitation, the sewage disposable system, and the water supply system. We established good system to prevent that's an, uh, any kind of infection from the environment. And vector control, especially for malaria, Japanese encephalitis, and also the dengue fever, and vaccination. And we have very good uh, infectious disease patient report and surveillance system. And we also try our best to treat the patient and isolate them, and then uh, keep a very good uh, system for the hospital infection control. And vaccine is a very important thing for this uh, immunization. And the first vaccine is a smallpox vaccine and invented by uh, Dr. Edward Jenner here. And this is a cartoon and painted in 1802. And people are really uh, annoying about the vaccination and they use cowpox to do this and uh, smallpox vaccination. And you see there's a lot of cow come out from this uh, bodies. So people are still very worried about that, but this is a very interesting one. And fortunately, the smallpox vaccination is very successful, uh, and then this is the very first infectious disease which has been uh, eradicated, totally eradicated from this world by uh, health personnel and by World Health Organization and all the health authorities in the world. And if you look at this uh, smallpox, it's a very severe disease, and the vaccination is simple, and uh, it can be uh, carried out, uh, this kind of vaccination program, in all the places in the world. And the vaccination program in the world is very successful, and that's the reason why in 1979, there was no more uh, smallpox in the world. And it's a very successful story of our World Health Organization. And for malaria eradication, by now, in Africa, as a still, malaria still become a very important disease, I just mentioned, that's a, among the, one of the case rates. But in Taiwan, we do have a malaria outbreak uh, very severely, dating back to early 20th century, and one out of six deaths are from the malaria. But after the Second World War, we have a very good program for the malaria education. We have uh, very good system for the diagnosis and treatment of the patient. They have a mosquito vector control using the DDT. We cannot use DDT any longer now. But at that time, we are allowed to do that. And look at that. In order to spread the DDT in all these townships, uh, people, uh, even with the bare foot, and then they 
the carrier uh, BDP and also the sprayer to go all the townships in Taiwan. And this uh, evacuation is very successful. Unfortunately, at that time, we got the USAID and also the UNICEF support. So in 19, uh, 1965, we got a certificate from World Health Organization saying, congratulations, Taiwan has eradicated the malaria in your country. And we are looking for uh, the second certificate to see is there any country get this kind of certificate. Unfortunately, we did not see anyone. So in other words, Taiwan is the only country eradicated malaria. And for the eradication of conventional infectious disease in Taiwan, basically, uh, Taiwan has a very good successful story. For instance, for the plague, it's at the 48, smallpox 55. I just mentioned that the world eradication of smallpox is 1979. So we are 24 years earlier. And malaria, 65. Poliomyelitis is 2000. And 2003, we come across the SARS. And then now, uh, we can't And although we try our best to, uh, to control all these conventional diseases, However, in the whole world, there's a challenges of emerging and re-emerging infectious disease. I cannot go through all these kind of uh, emerging or re-emerging infectious diseases. But why? Why we have a good vaccine, good antivirals, and good antibiotics, we still have the outbreak of the emerging infectious disease. The reason for that is the globalization and the popu population growth and the overall development of the land and livestock industry Excess on a, a carbon dioxide emission and global warming and the conflict of war and open sexual behavior and evolution, evol evolution of uh, drug resistant uh, infectious agent and also there's a pandemic illicit and uh, drug abuse. So uh, once we come across this kind of emerging uh, infectious disease, uh, we have to try our best to contain it, to control it. And the SARS is one. SARS is a uh, new emerging virus with a general susceptibility. It means that everybody will be infected and with very high fatality. One out of the 10 infected will die from the diseases. And the disease will lead to fibrosis and respiratory failure and death. Unfortunately, in year 2002, the disease originated in Guangdong, uh, China, and at that time, uh, nobody knows the natural history, transmission mode, how to do the diagnosis, how to treat the patient. Totally unknown. And then how are you going to control this kind of outbreak? And of course, at the very beginning, it's very difficult. So the disease spread to Hong Kong, uh, and then to Beijing, Vietnam, Hanoi, Vietnam, Singapore, Toronto, in Canada, Taiwan, and other areas in, in the world. And in Taiwan, uh, we can we start our SARS control program in year 2003 during this uh, springtime. At the very beginning, we have a lot of uh, Taiwanese businessmen working in mainland China, and they got an infection, came back to Taiwan, and become ill, and go to the hospital, and infected uh, their family members or healthcare uh, uh, workers. So we organized the National SARS Control and Medication Committee in this cabinet. And we have an advisory committee. And I will mention some academicians who have a lot of contribution. And we try to isolate the patient and then treat this other context and do this hospital infection surveillance. And at that time, we urge all people in Taiwan to measure their body temperatures twice a day. If there's a fever, we ask them to go to the fever clinic for further uh, clinical management and we have a uh, quick and a molecular diagnosis and so forth. But more importantly is that at that time, people really panic on this kind of outbreak. So the transparency and open data is very important. Unfortunately, in the very beginning of the outbreak in Guangdong and Beijing, people are trying to hide in any kind of information and it makes people feel even more panic. And during this time, we tried to ask for help from World Health Organization. Unfortunately, for the first five months, we did not get any response from the World Health Organization. But, and fortunately, we got some US CDC support to help us to control 
this uh, SARS outbreak. At that time, Academia Sinica, National Health Research Institute, and also academicians, uh, Michael Lai, Dijin Chen, Pedro Chen, and also Han Zi Yang, they helped uh, this uh, uh, combating of the SARS outbreak. If we got, go through this uh, global SARS statistic, in total, there's uh, 8,000 people uh, uh, infected by the virus, and the healthcare worker took around one-fifth of it, and totally there is uh, 774, around 10% will die from the disease. For this uh, pandemic influenza, it's only one per thousand, but this is uh, 10%. So that's the reason why people feel very uh, panicked to it. And if we look at this uh, reported uh, SARS probable cases, China's number is 5,000, and Hong Kong is around uh, 1,800, and Taiwan is 346. And at that time, World Health Organization started the very first time in the human history that they give the traveling alert to say, oh, Guangdong is not, uh, you should not go to Guangdong if it's not necessary. Don't, go, don't travel to Guangdong. We call this the traveling alert. And then they will study this kind of a warning and then end it. In Guangdong, Hong Kong, Beijing, this uh, traveling alert lasts around two months. And in Taipei, it's uh, around uh, six weeks. And Taiwan as a whole is only four, four weeks. And if we look at this uh, local transmission area, La Pietro also listed a uh, different area for uh, local transmission. And for local transmission in Taiwan, it's only 46 days. It's much better than other countries. The reason for that is, of course, we have been well prepared for it. And the second thing is that we come across this outbreak much later, so we can learn from others. So it is very important to share information and share experiences with others. And with regard to the instance rate of SARS per 100,000, you can see Taiwan is only 2.9. 100,000, but in Hong Kong, Beijing, and Singapore, they are much higher in Taiwan. So after we control this and, uh, uh, SARS, we consider, oh, everything is okay now, so we are very happy, but uh, unfortunately, at that time, there was another outbreak, it's the avian influenza, H5N1, and also a warning sign of the pandemic influenza. So we use our efforts try to prepare for the pandemic influenza and avian influenza using this uh, rapid diagnosis. And for the avian flu, you have to pay attention to the poultry industry. And that's uh, for the uh, infection control, both the birds and uh, human, and we have to do the surveillance and so forth. But more important thing is that uh, for the information networking, transparency is very important. So, so I would like to stress the importance of that. According to the preparedness uh, of our 20 countries in Asian Pacific region, there's a pretty Leo's and uh, Security Asia made some assessment in April 2005, 2005, and they found that the most risky country is for the H5N1 avian flu is Vietnam, Thailand, and China, and this risky, risky country is Japan, Australia, and Taiwan. And how good is the assessment? Basically, the assessment is quite good. This is the data uh, in year 2008, and you can see that, yeah, indeed, the Vietnam and also Thailand and Indonesia, they have a very high uh, prevalence of H5N1 in birds or poultry uh, population. And for human beings, indeed, that's in China, in Vienna and also in Thailand and Indonesia. And for a lot of people are uh, died or affected by the H5N1 avian influenza. So uh, after this uh, uh, avian influenza, and our CDC said, oh, we can have a rest. But no, you can never rest. Because there's another kind of a pandemic influenza, that's a so-called H1N1. Uh, and that's uh, started from Mexico and then spread out to the whole world. In Taiwan, we try our best to uh, prepare for it, and then we increase in the accessibility to rapid screening and antiviral uh, through our national health insurance system, and we increase the H1N1 
vaccination coverage up to 25% of, of the total population, uh, we rank at the number five in the world, and 75% of school children were vaccinated by H1N1 vaccine. And if we look at the H1N1 influenza mortality rate, and you can see here, the among the OECD countries, Taiwan is the last third, uh, next to Japan, Belgium, and Ta Taiwan. So for the acute infectious disease control, basically we are doing something good, but uh, we still have to prepare for uh, any kind of emerging infectious diseases. And now I would like to sh share with you that in addition to these so-called acute uh, infectious diseases, there's a chronic infection also important. For instance, uh, according to World Health Organization statistics in year 2000, hepatitis B killed around a half million to 750,000 people, and hepatitis C killed around one quarter million of uh, the people in the world. And if you look at this uh, global liver cancer instance, you can see, unfortunately, in our uh, East Asia and Southeast Asia, and also Sub-Saharan Africa, have the highest instance of liver cancer. If we look at that, this on uh, the map, and we try to figure out why, which one, which, what, the, what is the cause of the liver cancer, and dating back to uh, 1970, uh, nobody uh, uh, quite, uh, quite sure, but uh, in 1960s, uh, Dr. Baruch uh, Brumer, he identified this hepatitis B vaccine, uh, when he was working in uh, NIH in the United States and later developed the diagnostic test and vaccine. And then he, this uh, achievement uh, let him uh, receive this uh, Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine in 1976. And the World Hepatitis Day was selected as the first day of uh, Dr. Bloomberg. And we all feel very honored that um, uh, uh, Dr. Bloomberg has a good relation with, ta with Taiwan and visit Taiwan frequently. He was our honorary uh, academician of Academic Sinica. But not only Dr. Bloomberg, a lot of academicians uh, in Academic Sinica all engaged in this uh, viral hepatitis research, including the Song Rui Rong, Lai Ming Zhao, Chen Ding Xi, Liao Yunhuan, Chen Pei Zhe, and Zhang Mei Hui. And this is a uh, uh, Taiwan Dan Bing Zhe, the father of liver disease. Um, our uh, professor uh, so And if you look at this uh, chronic HCV infection and HBV infection, you can see that the area with the high instance of liver cancer ha also have high HCV or HBV infection. However, in different co continents, the importance of HBV and HCV are different. This is the data in 2013. That's a totally, that's a uh, uh, around a half million annual cases of SCC. And if you look at the data that uh, in Europe and North um, America, hepatitis C virus infection is more important. It uh, took around 50% uh, to 70% and HBV around 10 to 20%. But in Asia, that's, uh, HBV is uh, took around 70%, HBV 20%. In Japan, um, HBV is more important than HBV. And uh, the entire HBV story, although the virus was identified by Dr. Bloomberg in, this, um, in Australia, so originally it was called or, or Australian antigen, but a uh, lot of uh, studies have been carried out in Taiwan. And for the transmission of hepatitis B in Taiwan was carried out by Dr. Uh, Palmer Beasley from the University of Washington in Seattle, and he found that uh, the reason for a baby to become a chronic carrier is their mother are the carrier. If the mother were surface antigen positive, around one third will become uh, a chronic carrier. If mother is an E antigen positive, means a very actively replication of the virus, mother, uh, then there's a 85% will become uh, chronic uh, carriers. And this is the uh, number one most frequently cited medical uh, articles in Taiwan by uh, Palmer Beasley. Uh, he carried out a prospective study of 22,000 men in Taiwan, and he found that for the surface antigen positive uh, person, uh, there's an instance of uh, primary hepatocellular carcinoma is uh, 
1,058. And for neck, service antigen negative is 5. So it's around 204 different. This is the very first longitudinal study to document the causation of the virus to, to induce the human cancer. That's the reason why it has been uh, quite frequently uh, cited. However, Palmer already found that not all the hepatitis B carrier, chronic carrier, will become uh, affected uh, by SCC. Then, uh, fortunately, I have a chance to follow a group of the people in Taiwan, and we found that in addition to hepatitis B service antigen, E antigen positive means the virus is actively replicating. The relative risk is much higher, 64, compared to E antigen negative one. So you can see service antigen negative, service antigen positive, inactive, and E positive. So E antigen is a very good predictor of the ACC risk of the chronic carrier. And we also, just as mentioned by President uh, Liao, we published a paper in uh, 2006 in JAMA. And this is also quite frequently decided but next to our Palmer Business paper. And you can see for the hepatocellular carcinoma and liver cirrhosis, the higher the viral load, the higher the uh, cumulative risk of hepatocellular carcinoma and the liver cancer. So there comes a question. If not everyone, not all the chronic carrier will become the SCC, can we precisely predict uh, a person's risk uh, 5 or 10 or 15 years later, and what kind, of, what kind of risk predictors we can use. And of course, I just mentioned about the e-antigen and the viral load, and then we also find the HBV, HCV genotype are important, and post characteristic, the age, the older age, and there's an uh, inflammation of our liver, that's all, elevated uh, ALT level, family history of SCC, alcohol consumption, gender are important. There are so many risk predictors. Can we come up with an easy to use one? I am a lazy one. I always try to use this uh, easy nomograph to tell the patient uh, the risk of the disease. For instance, if it's a male, has a two point, age 50 to 54, a family, no family history, no alcohol intake, and serum ART level is uh, high, and have a uh, e antigen negative and high viral load. Then all these uh, uh, numbers add up is a uh, 12. Then we can see that 4 to 5 percent uh, of them will develop SCC within five years, and 10 to 11 percent will develop SCC in 10 years. So we use this risk calculator to uh, let the physician and the patient know that their risk. However, any kind of a risk calculator has to uh, validate uh, by uh, other uh, cohort study and also by uh, different in different countries. And so we have uh, our RISB study. We use our review of HBV cohort to come up the risk score and then uh, validate by the hospital-based international cohort from uh, Chinese University in Hong Kong, Yonsei University in Korea, and University of Hong Kong. And the result is this uh, risk predictor is quite valid and very good, but we have to make it friendly to, to the patient. So we use a uh, different kind of a risk assessment program on the website, and they just key in this uh, age, gender, and ALT label, e antigen, and HBV, and will come out this uh, lifetime risk. And we can also use that for SC, uh, chronic hepatitis C. Okay. Now, a patient already know that he has a high risk to uh, develop these uh, diseases. Can we help them? And when Palmer Beasley found that uh, there's a uh, mother of E antigen uh, positive one who likely to transmit the virus to, the, uh, to their newborns. So he studied the uh, vaccine trial in Taiwan. And this is the very first uh, vaccine trial in infants uh, in Taiwan. And you can see that for the control group, after the, uh, for the placebo, 90% uh, will develop, become the chronic carrier, and for the vaccinated one, only 6%. So the vaccine become very, very successful to prevent the carrier status. And then, uh, Dr. Song Rello and Dr. Chen Jin Xin, and also other 
uh, government uh, officers decided that Taiwan has to uh, launch that uh, hepatitis B vaccination program, and this is uh, the, the data after the launch of this uh, hepatitis B uh, vaccination program, and that, uh, academician Zhang Meihui documented that for the unvaccinated cohort, uh, that's uh, for the children aged 6 to 9, that's an uh, ACC risk is only 0.552 per 100,000, and for the uh, vaccinated one is 0.13. In other words, 75% of the childhood liver cancer can be prevented by vaccine. And we keep following this cohort of the people, and you can see that even up when they grow up to age of 20 to 25, this is for the vaccinated, unvaccinated uh, men, and this is vaccinated men, and this is women. And you can see that we started this uh, the immunization program in July 1984, and you can see by uh, year 2001 and 2004, that's uh, 80% of this uh, liver cancer has been prevented. So hepatitis B immunization is very successful, so we definitely have call for that. Unfortunately, we still found some vaccine failing. Service antigen passed in modern, uh, some of the, 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 their newborns even get the vaccine, still uh, become the chronic carrier. So we suggest to give this antiviral therapy uh, during the third trimester to the pregnant mother. And we also suggest that hepatitis B immunoglobin has to be given within four hours rather than 24 hours of the birth. And uh, the complete vaccination on schedule is very important. And immunization is a magnet for solidarity, transcends uh, borders and sectors. It has compelling public and political appeal, and is an especially rewarding investment for governments and donors. And thanks to uh, all these uh, investigators, and we have found that uh, hepatitis B vaccine now is included in the National uh, Infant Immunization Program of 184 countries now. But for those who are already infected by HBV and become a chronic carrier, vaccine cannot help. And can we help them uh, using antivirals? The answer is yes. This is by pro uh, academic uh, in Fan Liao. And he used a very early drug called the Navimudi. And people treat with Navimudi, as you can see here, only 5% after the 36, year, uh, 36 months will develop liver cancer. For the placebo, it's a 21%. So it's a very, very uh, efficient and adequate uh, to prevent that uh, liver cancer. So after the SARS outbreak, when I was still working in this uh, Ministry of Health, we started this uh, antiviral therapy program in October year 2003. And as you can see here, if after we started to treat hepatitis B and also hepatitis C patient, this is the data from this, uh, 2000 to 2003, and then all down to 2012 to 2015. This is mortality from liver cancer and liver chronic liver disease and cirrhosis, and this is instance from liver cancer. You can see this on a very significantly, gradually uh, decrease of this uh, mortality and the instance. If you look at this uh, overall data for chronic liver disease and cirrhosis mortality, after we launched this program uh, 12 years later, 30% of the chronic liver disease has, uh, deaths has been prevented for the hepatocellular carcinoma mortality and also for ACS instance, all showed very significant reduction. So antiviral uh, treatment definitely can help people to uh, develop this, uh, chronic liver diseases or ACC. However, only 20% eligible patient in Taiwan were treated, and we have to develop the new drugs to cure CHP rather than give them for lifelong, and also ineligible, ineligible patient at the increase the risk of SCC. They are not suitable for antiviral, but they still have the risk to develop the SCC. We have to give this, them this early detection uh, help. And so for the new targets of this uh, HBV therapy, is um, still waiting all of us to 
are developing in France. And there's a uh, Taiwan uh, investigator also involved in this uh, clinical guideline and uh, uh, preparation, and all, not only for the Asian Pacific, European, and American, and also for the uh, World Health Organization. And now, viral hepatitis animation was considered as one of the SDG and by World Health Organization, and it is expected that uh, by 2030, 90% of the new infection will be prevented, and 65% of the deaths from HPV and SCV will be uh, reduced. And it is hoped that uh, we can help uh, all these uh, nations in the world uh, to attend this kind of uh, goal to prevent uh, liver cancer uh, through this uh, elimination of hepatitis B and hepatitis C. However, we have to bear in mind that different strategies have to be adopted in different regions of countries because they have different transmission routes, different uh, immunization choice schedule, and also the diagnosis treatment, the availability and accessibility has to be taken into consideration, and healthcare infrastructure and manpower uh, are also to be considered. And more importantly, I think that uh, we need uh, international some of the countries in the world need international help, and Taiwan is willing to help all those uh, developing countries who are trying to uh, eliminate hepatitis B. And last part of my talk, I'm going to talk about this, uh, environmental diseases. And we are not only collaborate with uh, the United States and other countries for this uh, infectious disease control and non-communicable disease control. We also have an international environmental partnership for environmental disease control. It's by US EPA and Taiwan EPA. And we uh, look at this uh, critical environmental challenges, such as air uh, pollution, contaminated site, and also environmental literacy and e-waste uh, management. And now I will share with you quickly this uh, the arsenic control in Taiwan. And arsenic is a ubiquitous element in the crest of the earth. It's transported in the environment by water, and human beings are exposed to uh, ingested or inhaled arsenic through environmental, occupational, dietary, and med medicinal exposures. And this, uh, after this uh, ingestion of the arsenic, will lead to this uh, characteristic skin lesions. And this includes uh, hyperpigmentation, hyperdrogosis, bone disease, and also this uh, skin cancers. And you can see here, this is a uh, hypoprotosis in China, there's an inner Mongolia. I was invited to give the consultation in inner Mongolia, uh, and also in India, uh, West Bengal of India. Maybe some of you are come from the West Bengal. And this is the case in Taiwan. You can see this is uh, bone diseases, and some of the facial cell carcinoma, and squamous cell carcinoma, and depigmentation and hyperpigmentation of the skin. And according to the study, that the higher the arsenic level, the higher the risk of the prevalence of the skin lesions in India, Bangladesh, China, and also, you can see that for the skin cancer in Taiwan, there's a higher the arsenic um, level in the drinking water, and the higher the risk of skin cancer, and especially the, for the elderly, the dose response is very striking. And there was a uh, mysterious uh, breast disease study back in 1950s in southwestern uh, Taiwan, and the patient were affected with this kind of diseases. You can see this, uh, there's a dry gangrene of the entire salt, and then there's uh, some of all this become the dry gangrene, and there's a spontaneous amputation of affected fingers, and for this victim, unfortunately, his foot has to be amputated to secure his life. And the breast disease originally was found only in Taiwan. But when I visited in India and Bangladesh, we found that this kind of uh, breast disease in India and also in Bangladesh. And if we want to talk about uh, arseniosis, chronic arsenic exposure, we have to mention about this uh, academician, uh, Ye Su. Uh, he's a pathologist. He has very well documented this uh, arsenic induced skin cancer, bone diseases, and also the breast disease. 
And also, National Taiwan University uh, College of Medicine have a breast disease research team. I go to the southwestern Taiwan, and there's uh, a lot of uh, famous and uh, public health and workers and uh, internal medicine doctors and so forth are involved in this team. And I would like to share with you the story. If you want to know why the people will come up with this kind of uh, affected with this kind of uh, breast disease, the reason for that, what's the cause? They go to this uh, endemic area to Jai and Tainan, and that's a uh, uh, um, five township there. And in that area, people use two kinds of well. One is the shallow well, and shallow well is not too deep. It's only uh, less than uh, seven meters uh, in in depth. And, but this is uh, a high uh, salt con concentration, so the, the water is not so well to drink. So people start to use this um, artesian well. They use the bamboo pipe to dig into the ground and when it reached 100 and 280 meters and then go to this uh, underground river, the water will come up automatically and then drink this kind of water. And they say, oh, this water is drink really good. Uh, some part sweet and not so salty, so they use this kind of water. Unfortunately, artesian well water has very high arsenic concentration. So, uh, if you look at this uh, the data from Dr. Zheng Wenbin, you can see that the higher the arsenic level, the higher the risk of the breast disease. So, uh, and the breast disease patient have a uh, very severe the skin uh, lesions and also the skin cancers as well. So how do we control this uh, uh, breast disease? Basically, it's quite easy. Well, all this artesian well has to be closed. And then we supplied clean water. And we also continued to test more than 80,000 wells in Taiwan, all over the Taiwan. And any well with this uh, high arsenic concentration water has to be crossed. And then we identify, in addition to the southwestern exposed area, there's a northeastern exposed area in Yilan County. But if you now you can visit Yilan because they never use this kind of well water, so it's safe to drink, to eat there. And most importantly, after we found that the people have exposed to arsenic for a long time, and we consider, we change the uh, water supply we may reduce their risk of the diseases, but unfortunately not. After they have a very long-term exposure to arsenic in drinking water, they can be affected by a series of diseases. This is are non-cancer diseases. I won't mention uh, all of them. And they have been uh, very frequently cited. The reason for that is this is the very first time we have very comprehensive a study of this uh, chronic arsenic exposure, and it can cause uh, diabetes, hypertension, heart disease, cerebral infarction, and also uh, cataract and erectile dysfunction, and also hepatitis and so forth, chronic kidney disease. And more importantly is that arsenic can induce not only skin cancer, it also will also cause these are the cancers of internal organs, including the lung cancer, urinary bladder cancer, kidney cancer, liver cancer, and prostate cancer. So in our study, published in Lancet, you can see that for all these uh, six cancers in men and five cancers in, female, in women, because uh, women have no prostate, right? And you can see that very striking dose response relationship. And now, in 1988, the people uh, the Greenpeace people in the United States start to worry about whether there's an uh, arsenic level in drinking water in the United the standard in the United States and uh, adopted by World Health Organization is good enough to protect uh, human health. And we were invited by uh, US NRC uh, to use our Taiwan data to do the uh, cancer risk assessment of the arsenic in drinking water. And I won't go to the detail. There's a data from the 42 villages in Taiwan and covered around uh, 490,000 person years. And in our collaboration with Harvard University, and we found that the current standard of 50 microgram per liter uh, 
set by the United States EPA and also World Health Organization is associated with a substantially increased uh, risk of uh, cancer. It's not sufficient protective of public health. So US EPA started to set the new criteria, but how did they do that? I would like to share with you that uh, this is the risk of carcinogen in drinking water. Arsenic, if we set the 50 ppb, the uh, cancer risk per 100,000 is 1,300 here is very high. If we extrapolate it to 20 uh, microgram per liter, then you can see that the risk is remain very high. But for the benzene, benzoepipine, all these kind of uh, chemical carcinogens in drinking water, basically they are really uh, small potato uh, compared with this uh, the arsenic. So 50 ppb definitely is too high. And then how, how are we going to decide this uh, maximum contamination level for? And at the very beginning, US EPA have a discussion with all these uh, consultants, and we decided that the zero is the goal. But zero is, is not possible because human beings are exposed to arsenic every day from the food, from the blood, from this uh, water, or from the air. So zero is, is, uh, is not um, uh, uh, feasible. And then they also consider the analytical measurement disparity, that the practical quantitation uh, limit. And this has to be used by the water world company to supply the tap water. And they consider that three microgram per liter uh, is the accuracy they can have. It. And the treatment visibility is three microgram per liter. But is three microgram per liter should be the goal? Of course, we have to consider the cost effectiveness. So uh, in the EPA, uh, we have to uh, discuss this and, uh, the benefit from reducing arsenic in drinking water below the maximum contamination level. If it is three or five ppb, 10 or 20, of course, if you set a very good, a very uh, stringent criteria, you can save a lot of people's lives and the total quantified health benefit will 200 to around 500 million US dollars. Oh, so we have to choose uh, the three microgram. But if you have elevated this level to 20, then of course the uh, health benefit is much less. However, if you want to go to three microgram per liter, then you have to uh, spend a lot of uh, annual cost to reduce the arsenic in drinking water. So for three microgram, the total national cost in the United States were around 700 to 800 uh, million dollars per year. And of course, if this, you uh, loosen this other criteria, it will cost less. So we have to balance the cost and the sort of benefit. And then uh, they started to choose uh, 10 microgram per BBB because it's a, it's a kind of balance, cost effective balance. But even though uh, they already decided to have 10 in year 2001, but this uh, compliance day for the new arsenic standard was set as uh, 2006 for five years. Uh, so it uh, takes a long time for uh, the United States to adopt it, the new standard. But th by now, Still, arsenic uh, contamination in water was observed in Chile, in India, in India, in Bangladesh, in many China, and many, many other countries, and Mexico. If you look at this kind of figure, in Bangladesh is around 30 million people, and this, uh, in West Bengal, India is 6 million people. They are exposed to a uh, higher level of arsenic drinking water. I won't go through this uh, all the details. But um, in Southeast Asia, um, also uh, a lot of people have uh, exposure to high arsenic level. So the strategies, strategies for mitigation of chronic arsenic poisoning from drinking water, we have to end elimination of all the wells with high arsenic water and supply safe water to areas uh, where the arsenic concentration in drinking water is high. And we have to monitor the arsenic in agricultural product irrigated by high arsenic water. And that's especially in 
which can go of India and this uh, Bangladesh and identify this uh, arsenic exposed uh, population and then detect their uh, clinical outcome and manage them. And we, through this kind of effort in Taiwan, in year 2000, and in year 2000, we uh, enjoyed this uh, uh, the number two uh, World Health and uh, ranking uh, in in Taiwan. But we still consider that in Taiwan, in, in the future, uh, we come across a lot of uh, public health challenges. If you look at this, uh, now, this is the birth rate in Taiwan is declining. And this is mortality rate is also declining much earlier than the birth rate. But now, our uh, natural growth rate is too low. So we come across the problem of the aging population in Taiwan. And you look at this uh, life expectancy. In 1906, the life expectancy is quite low. It's only 30. Of course, uh, after the Second World War, it's uh, now 40 to 50. And now, in Taiwan, we enjoy a very uh, a prolonged life and uh, longevity uh, for 77 years uh, for the men and 83 years for women. So Taiwan come across a, a big challenge of aging population. So we have to have a very good national health insurance in Taiwan in order to provide uh, good equal access of medical service to, to everybody in Taiwan. And I will go through the this a detail of how good is the national health systems in Taiwan. And also, we start our community-based long-term care 2.0 uh, to uh, meet this, uh, this, uh, the need of the aging population. And we start our integrated community-based patient-centered care system. And we hope that this kind of initiative will be uh, the foundation for more comprehensive and resilient, resilient uh, medical and public health systems in Taiwan. And in Taiwan, we also try our best to engage in innovation-based biomedical industry and our 5 plus 2 innovation-based industry program, selected biomedical industry as one of it. And then uh, we have uh, three biomedical science park, and we also have a big program to strengthen the IND, ID protection, talent cultivation, capital investment, and regulatory consultation for the pharmaceutical and medical equipment industry in Taiwan. And this year, fortunately, and our uh, regulatory uh, uh, organization was uh, recognized as the international uh, regulatory member and by International Council of Harmonization. And last one is that uh, we also have uh, for our or promote that uh, global public health, we have a very good emergent uh, response to a uh, natural disaster, and we have collaborated with USA and Japan to start this uh, regional emergency medical response mechanism and try to send out uh, disaster medical assistance teams to these uh, affected uh, countries and to help them. So I think that uh, in the future, that's uh, for the global public health. We have to adopt it. That's a uh, new technology. And precision medicine is very important. And this included this uh, preventive medicine, predictive medicine, personalized medicine, and participatory medicine. So the entire world have to work together, hand in hand, and then to help this, uh, each other and to attend that's uh, the base, the foundation of the human rights is this. Uh, a uh, better uh, global public health. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for the very exciting talk, and, and we have a few minutes uh, to entertain some questions. Any questions in the audience? Yeah, we have one here. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, in a very nice and <laughs> informative presentation, and we get to we learn a lot. And I'm just curious, based on your presentation, I noticed that the, uh, for example, you have this uh, liver cancer disease, you have a distribution Asia and uh, Africa, somehow I've expected the most. And uh, like in the, uh, the uh, avian, avian influenza, the h 5 m one you see that those all happening in the Southeast Asia. Yes. And I was wondering whether or not there's any 
any reason why this disease are distributed in this way, okay. it is better. And the second question it has to do with the arsenic, arsenic um, and, and area, affected area. In Taiwan, you have no, we, we notice this two, two regions, south and the north. Yeah. And then is this still the case or this no, that was the past? Okay. <laughs> uh, for the first question, well, you, you should become an uh, uh, epidemiologist to answer the question. But for this, uh, all kinds of uh, infectious agents has this uh, specific um, uh, prevalent area. And uh, <coughs> for this uh, hepatitis B and hepatitis C, indeed, uh, this, uh, they, in, in Africa, they have very good Okay, thank you very much. And um, in there's a virus indeed spread out in the whole world and in the South Saharan Africa, the hepatitis B and hepatitis C infection are still very high there. And why H1N1 is not there? H5N1 is spread by uh, migratory birds uh, from the sun, uh, Alaska and uh, Siberia, and then every every uh, every spring. The migratory birds are flight from this uh, North Pole to southern and uh, southeastern China and uh, southeastern Asia, and then they carry the, the virus. The uh, water birds basically they got infection, they won't become here, so they can fly a long way and carry the virus to us. And when they can, when this migratory bird come to this uh, southeastern Asian country, they were infected as a local bird. And all the uh, poultry population, the chickens or ducks or, or goose, geese. And uh, land birds, the uh, chicken and a turkey, they are, once they got infected, they will die immediately and a very, very high mortality rate. But the water bird basically is okay. So, and the reason for this kind of ge geographical differences in this uh, disease distribution is that because there's a uh, we have this uh, migratory bird to send us this uh, Christmas gift uh, <laughs> from the uh, northern uh, countries. And in this uh, uh, arsenic exposure area in southwestern Taiwan and, and also in uh, Ilan, uh, because uh, we have tested all the uh, wells people used for drinking water, and once this uh, arsenic level is high, then we totally abandoned it totally close there. So for the time being, uh, nobody is drinking this uh, high arsenic uh, well water, uh, no longer. Unfortunately, for those who have consumed high, high arsenic uh, drinking water for a long period, they still have uh, adverse health span. They have to be followed until they pass away. So we have to help people to do that. Yes. Yes, please. Um, Taiwan has been very successful in uh, eradicating diseases that have been showing up here. Um, how much of the that do you think has been a role of it being an island? And how easy do you think it would be for other island nations to implement programs that Taiwan has showed, seen success in? Yeah. Thank you very much for your question. You. You should be a good um, public health practitioner. <laughs> yeah, you will be. The reason for that is the reason for Taiwan can contain malaria. Basically, Taiwan is an island, and uh, the mosquitoes cannot fly from uh, Vietnam to Taiwan unless unless they they get into this airplane and then come to Taiwan. But it happens. We we have documented that too. But uh, no. so that's the reason why Taiwan can take malaria very, very easily because we can con control this uh, mosquito vector very easily. And but since there's a globalization and very frequent international uh, transportation, and for mosquito bone diseases, it's not easy to spread out. But for human bone diseases, I mean the transmitted from man to human to human. It's still very easy to uh, transmit it from one country uh, to another country. SARS is one of the example, and influenza virus is another example. So I think that uh, for Taiwan, it's easier for us to control 
uh, this kind of infectious disease. And for the uh, dengue fever, we have this uh, mosquito vector, but every winter we don't have any kind of uh, dengue fever. But uh, up to the uh, during the uh, springtime, a lot of uh, visitors came from southeastern Asia, and then uh, visitors, uh, Taiwan visitors, go to uh, uh, southeastern Asia for traveling, for sightseeing, and then they carry back the virus. <coughs> and the virus and the mosquitoes in Taiwan uh, join together, infect another one. So in, for the uh, dengue fever control, we have uh, infrared and, uh, camera to measure this uh, body temperature of any kind of inbound passengers. And among this, uh, 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 all these uh, uh, important cases, we can identify around uh, 50%, half of those uh, imported uh, dengue fever cases can be identified. So I think that uh, border surveillance, border quarantine is very important. But if Taiwan is next to another countries, such as the uh, uh, African countries, uh, that would be even more difficult to control. And if that's the case, then you definitely, we definitely have to help them. So all the countries have to work hand in hand and, and work together. I once uh, see a uh, Secretary General of uh, Pan Africa Health Organization, and they are trying to organize 15 countries together to control a lot of infectious disease. Yeah, people have to work together, otherwise we cannot solve the problem. Okay, one last question before we close. Uh, please. Yes. So your question is, how can we solve this kind of uh, public health problems in different countries? Yeah, like uh, say immunotherapy is very expensive. Oh, okay. Cases, so how can we monitor the national Okay, good. You asked a very good question, and I forgot to mention about that. Um, when our machine company in Taiwan, there are two machine companies in Taiwan, uh, and we have been uh, visited by uh, different kind of uh, original affiliated organization, and they urge all the uh, vaccine companies in the world to donate 30% of their uh, production for the developing country, for the uh, underprivileged country. And I think this is a very good uh, procedure. I, the reason for me to put this as science and humanity is that we have definitely have to have a humanitarian aid to this uh, countries who need a vaccine or need antivirals. And also for antivirals, for hepatitis B and hepatitis C antivirals, and for this uh, uh, underprivileged country, basically the cost of the price are uh, further reduced under the negotiation between this uh, WHO and the pharmaceutical companies. I, I think that uh, we definitely ur urge all this uh, our pharmaceutical company and to lower their price of this uh, new drugs or, or new vaccine. And World Health Organization is doing something good. And for recent, in recent uh, Global Health Forum uh, held in Taipei, there's a uh, representative from Vatican also urged Taiwan's uh, uh, drug companies and uh, vaccine companies to help to donate some of these uh, medicines for the, pe for the people who are uh, in that in uh, urgent need. So I think there's a uh, solidarity, so uh, to help each other, the international collaboration is very important. When there's a uh, pandemic flu uh, in Taiwan and we can control it, we still have a uh, uh, temi flu uh, antiviral for influenza virus available. We still have this uh, Vienna. 
and they are in the urgent need, so we send some drugs to them. I think this, uh, uh, this kind of uh, humanitarian action is definitely very important. If you don't control the outbreak in another country, someday, somehow, it will infect your country. It always uh, cross the border. So we, we are family, basically. All of us, we are family. We cannot let our brothers or sisters out of this kind of protection uh, uh, circle. Okay, thank you very much uh, for the very informative and stimulating talk. At this time, we have a small token of appreciation to present to uh, Vice President Chen.